Hello there ladies and gentlemen, TX141 here, also known as Paul, welcoming you to an all new Ace in the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode we shall be reviewing the Mitsubishi J2M2 Raiden, a Japanese fighter aircraft coming at a tier of 2 and a battle rating of 3.3. Due to the history behind the J2M in general being rather complex, we shall only be covering the history of the plane for its design specifications all the way up to the J2M2 variant depicted here on your screen today. We begin in October 1938, with the design being the child of Jiro Horikoshi's discussions with the Imperial Japanese Naval Air Force for the creation of a land-based interceptor that emphasised speed and climb rate over manoeuvrability. However, due to the occupation of the Imperial Japanese Naval Air Force with Horikoshi's other infamous creation, the A6M Raisin, the initial specification for the J2M was only drawn up as of September 1939, outlining the plane as a land-based interceptor able to reach a maximum speed of 600 km an hour at 6,000 meters altitude, and to be able to reach this altitude in less than five and a half minutes. The plane was also to be able to run at full engine power for 45 minutes before needing to refuel, and was to be armed with the same armament layout as in the A6M2. The engine selected to power this airframe was the Mitsubishi HAF-32 Kasei Model 13 14-cylinder air-cooled radial engine, providing an output of 1,440 horsepower to turn a three-blade propeller. The design phase for the initial J2M1 prototype then began in January 1940, but the prototype was only rolled off the assembly line as of February 1942, due to higher priority being made to develop the A6M variants. The first prototype J2M1 was to fly to the first time on the 20th of March 1942. This and its two successor prototypes were to be received by their pilots with mixed reviews, with pilots saying that the planes handled well, yet there were some issues, especially pertaining towards cockpit visibility and control stiffening above 520 km an hour. Additionally, the climb rate and top speed of these planes were well below that specified in the original specification. The fourth prototype, the J2M2, was set up to rectify these issues. Fielding the Mitsubishi MK4RA Kasei 23A radial engine with a water methanol injection feeding into the supercharger to provide up to an output of 1,820 horsepower. Along with this, a new four blade propeller was also introduced. The cockpit canopy was redeveloped in order to provide greater visibility, and the first J2M2 prototype flew for its initial test flight on the 12th of October 1942. The armament was also updated at this point, with the two 20mm cannons in the wings being switched to the 2 by 20 mm Type 99 Model 2 cannons with 200 rounds per gun, and the standardised two 7.7mm Type 97 machine guns above the engine had 550 rounds per gun, and they were the same machine guns as in the Zero. Despite the success of the initial test flights of the J2M2, a full evaluation period was not conducted and the plane was rushed into production, with the first production variants of the J2M2 arriving at the end of 1942. This was to prove a devastating mistake, with the engine in further flights being found to be unreliable at best, emitting smoke when run at full power, and the plane was to vibrate at given speeds. Even with gradual modifications mitigating these problems over time, only 11 J2M2s have been delivered by March 1943. Things were to only get worse when the second of the J2M2s was to be lost during a takeoff accident on the 16th of June 1943. A near similar incident was to occur a month later with the 10th J2M2, and it was found that the plane's controls would become stuck in the dive position after the tailwheel had retracted on takeoff. Turning our page here. This additional problem delayed the rollout of the first group of J2M2 Model 11 fighters to combat service until December of 1943, with only 141 J2M2s being produced in total from 1943 to 1944. A final unresolved problem was to also occur, and this was encountered for the first time as of January 1944, with the 30th J2M2 disintegrating in mid-air. A number of reasons were suggested but none of the reasons or the improvements that came out of these reasoning lines were to actually remove this danger, where a number of other J2M2 fighters also ended up to disintegrate in mid-air as well. This unresolved problem meant that only 155 J2M2s were produced when production switched to the J2M3 in May 1944, and the combat service of the J2M2 was to be questionable at best. Well, a historical overview out of the way then, let us see how the J2M2 handles in War Thunder. 
For today's game, we're on the ground strike map top of the world using the following setup. Stealth belts are our 20mm cannons. The reasoning here is that the mixture of high explosive fragmentation and armor piercing sentry rounds works very well to defeat any opponent we may face, whether they be bomber or fighter alike. To range in these stealth belts, we need to use the omnipurpose belts on our 7.7mm machine guns, with the tracers doing exactly what they say on the tin, and the armor piercing rounds having the very rare effect of killing pilots thanks to penetration of canopy glass. To bring this all together we are using a 300m gun convergence as we intend to spare our ammo by engaging our opponents at closer ranges, but this also provides us with a decent amount of spray to our ammunition when we engage bombers at longer distances, i.e. in distances of 600m or more, but more on that later. We are also using a 30 minute fuel load here to ensure that we can make it to the end of the game and scaved in terms of fuel capacity. So this means that we begin by highlighting one of the key strengths of the J2M2, and that is its pure climb rate pace. Being able to get up to an altitude in excess of 4000 meters here well before anything else can, and this applies especially within its tier and battle rating, being one of the best climbers if not the best. As we level out at 4100 meters altitude and a speed of 250 km an hour, we switch over to highlighting one of the key weaknesses of this plane, and that is its straight line acceleration which is rather poor, and it means that at speeds of 200 km an hour all the way up to 500 km an hour, if not more, you are going to struggle to pick up speed, being a very gradual process unless you employ war emergency power to accelerate this. Still, we have afforded ourselves enough time to build up our speed before going head to head with the P63A5 King Cobra here, and we are going to use our great overall control responsiveness to snap rounds the way they are incoming fire, for a combination of three control surfaces, the elevator, the ailerons, and the rudder. With the P63 taken out by our friendly A6M2 Raisin here, we're going to provide a direct comparison as we both chase after the enemy Hellcat from earlier. The Zero has the advantage at first, but we are going to overtake them, thanks to our better acceleration at speeds of 300km an hour or more. We have very consistent acceleration in a straight line, although it is poor, meanwhile the Zero's acceleration is at low speeds, i.e. less than 300km an hour. Although this means with our superior climb rate and superior straight line speed, we can pick up the, hill, the kill on the Hellcat and make it kill number one. We're going to come on a little bit later how the two planes, i.e. the Zero and the J2M2, compare in terms of manoeuvrability. But in the meantime, we break around to notice a friendly Adornia 217J1 hanging just over the enemy spawn point, and they may lure up a couple of enemy fighters for us to take out. As we level out, we can see that our speed is continually increasing along with our altitude, and you will find over time that the J2M2 will push above 550 km an hour if you allow it to do so. Although we go into a dive here to try and essentially ward away the boomerang that is pursuing our Dornia 217J1, and we do so perfectly. Now using our reasonably tight turn circle, although it is not as tight as that of a Spitfire Mark IIb if the Spitfire is using its landing flaps, or indeed not as tight as that of a Kai 43 it's almost as tight as that as a Kai 61 and it's definitely not as tight as that of an A6M0, in order to cause the boomerang to stall out and our friendly F4U Corsair to knock them out before we can come down on them and wreak our damage. We level out once again towards the sun before going into an Immelman, looking around for another target to hit. This means that we have already essentially said that the manoeuvrability of the J2M2 is not as great as that of a Zero. The control surfaces all respond very well, but they are not quite as powerful as that of the A6M2. And then you can out dogfight the majority of the planes you will face, but not every given one of them, with the planes that you will not be able to do out dogfight as easily being listed just a couple of seconds ago. Although here we are going to show how the J2M2 can quickly switch into an energy fighter role as we go to boom and zoom on this Messerschmitt 19 ml one While control surfaces stand consistent, even at speeds in excess of 750 km an hour, and we pick up kill number 2. This is much different from the A6M2 whose roll rate locked up at 450 km an hour at a rather excruciating rate. As we zoom climb away with our energy conserved very nicely, we loop over, as we feel we've got time and space for another boom and zoom pass. Looking towards the majority of the enemy fighters here being in the midst of a low altitude furball, we want to make sure that we do not attract the attentions of the enemy bow fighter or Spitfire out on the edge, although the Spitfire is looking towards us. So we're going to make a quick pass, aiming towards the IL 2M Type 3 here, and we pick up the third kill accordingly thanks to the lethality of our 20mm cannons, getting in close before we direct our fire onto target. We continue to accelerate away here, knowing that the Spitfire Mark IIb is pursuing us at a distance of 730 meters right now. As we break past the bridge, or at least the damage supports, we see that the Spitfire has broken off thanks to our brilliant overall energy retention in the midst of a dive and then flying out straight. 
we begin to reload, and we note here that reloads will be required when you've got the space to do so, because of the limited ammunition you can carry in terms of the 20mm cannons. But we must come onto the point here about close range engagements when we go up against enemy fighters and conserving ammo, and the reason why we want the spray at longer distances when engaging enemy bombers. The reasoning is this. The J2M2, much like its Zero counterparts, is an incredibly fragile fighter. If it is hit by the rear facing turret of a B25 Mitchell for too long, or even the 7.92mm machine gun turret of a Heinkel 111 at the back, this plane will burst into flames. Thanks to the fact that the fuel tanks are incredibly flammable, do not seem to be very well protected, and the same applies to the engine, which gets doesn't get knocked out as easily as some may expect, but it seems to catch fire quite frequently. So this is something to be aware of, and the reason why we want to hit bombers at longer distances, or attack them really fast from the front, where available. In the case of B25 Mitchells, we of course want to take an offset approach, and not engage their direct fire in 12.7mm machine guns firing from their nose. Returning to the gameplay here, we go back into a climb rather than strike down on the furball in the midst of the map. We pick up on the fact there's an I-185 in the distance, flying off to our left, probably engaging another friendly fighter, and we need to be wary of them. But we also have to keep an eye on the fact there are some enemy fighters, including the MiG-3, that have just come out of the spawn and are pushing for altitude, or at least we think so. Again, using our superior climb rate, we are able to pick up the altitude advantage very quickly, and we notice an enemy Wellington that has also spawned in, and we gradually want to make our way over towards them being the more valuable target here in the midst of a ground strike game. Although the enemy I-185 has just dealt with one of our friendly fighters, a Messerschmitt Y-9F, and they are now pushing over towards us. We will not be able to outrun the I-185 in the long distance haul, with their plane having the superior acceleration to ours, and so we need to attack them accordingly. We are going to use the same approach as with the P-63A5 King Cobra from the start, using a very sharp snap roll here to ensure that they cannot get their free 20mm cannons onto us. As we've snapped past them, we now begin to use our superior manoeuvrability to gradually come around, while our turn circle being tighter, and as they come up trying to turn around to get a shot onto us, we can turn in before them and begin to get a shot onto them. We're going to see here how the armour piercing rounds and the 7.7mm machine guns can provide us with that pilot kill we were talking about earlier. And with our fourth kill now in the bag, we were said to come onto the point that if we were flying an A6M2 rise, uh, sorry, raise in there, we would have quite quickly outturned the I-185 and had a shot onto target. Meanwhile, the J2M2, as just demonstrated, it took us a little bit longer, but still just as manageable. We note here that the Wellington is going off into a dive, so we will not pursue them, although we have noticed a Heinkel 111 also trying to level bomb, and this is going to make for a much easier target. We also pick up on the fact that B25 Mitchell and a PE2 have just spawned in, although more on those in a short while. Here we're going to see how the cannons can work at longer distances thanks to the spray, at a distance of approximately 650 metres being able to achieve a critical hit on the Heinkel 111 H3, and as we hit 300 meters, we rip them apart. We then Immelman out, before looking around to see the B25 Mitchell and the PE2 both coming towards us. And they seem to be working in tandem here, with the B25 acting as the bait rather than going for the direct head-on, in order to try and force us to turn around on them, as whilst we do have two 20mm cannons, they may not always be effective at longer distances, as we will see here when we missed, but this is more of a pilot error rather than the ammunition that we have. Instead of trying to follow the B-25 around, we snap right out of the way of the incoming PE-2's fire, but we also have a Hellcat which we picked up on very quickly as we are going into that head-on engagement there, and we wanted to make sure we could snap rail past them as well. As they level out, having stalled out, using all their energy to climb up towards us, we pick up our ace in a day, setting them on fire, and just gradually baiting them around for a cleaner shot on target. So that's our sixth kill there. We level out the B-25 and the P-2, having both flying away, the B-25 underneath us and the P-2 pushing towards our bases, and we look around to see another enemy Hellcat coming up towards us. And here we're going to show the superb stall characteristics of the J-2M2, which carry over in a way from the Zero. Keep in mind that the stall speed of the J-2M2 comes in at approximately 135 km an hour, if not 130 km an hour, and this is incredible, especially by comparison with the Hellcat, which we'll once ago, again go head to head with, but snap right out of the way of, and then gradually come over the top of them. The intention here is to tease them rather horrifically, and we balance things on a knife edge here to make sure they stall out right behind us. Don't try this at home, kids, unless you really enjoy flying the J2M2 as I do. As we can see here, the Hellcat's almost got a shot at the target, but by managing our engine and our combat flaps, we can come around right behind them and use our superior low speed maneuverability to pick them off and pick up our seventh and final kill for this game. And the low speed handling characteristics of the J2M2 are exceptional. They're not in the league of saying A6M2, but they are very good. And we say that as we conclude the game and take a look towards the post game stats. We 
can see here that our 7 kills allowed us to obtain 30,156 silver lines and accrete a further 1,484 research points, with 594 going towards our continued work on the Kai 84 Otsu. We must now come onto the consideration of how one can defeat the J2M2 in a given matchup. And if you are not flying a plane such as a Spitfire Mark IIb, a Kai 43, a Kai 61, or an A6M2 with similar to or superior maneuverability and superior turn circle, the alternative is to use a series of relentless and elongated head-ons. Planes such as the Akovlev Yak-1B, the Typhoon Mark 1A, and the P-51 Mustang with 20mm cannons will all work well in this regard, as you are exploiting three key factors or weaknesses to the J2M2's constituency. Firstly, the fact that its 20mm cannons are in the wings and are therefore convergence reliant. Secondly, that this plane has very poor straight line acceleration when it comes around to try and get a shot on you as you break away. And thirdly, that the plane has high flammability and low durability. You only need a successful 1-2 second burst in order to set this plane on fire or cut it into more than one piece. Nonetheless, as we are going to see shortly, by being able to switch between the energy fighter and turn fighter roles on a dime, this jack of all trades fighter has enabled us to come first. Indeed, for those who consider the Japanese fighter line to be known as the purely turn fighter line, especially within the battle rating set of say 2.7 to 3.7 and a tier of 2, you may want to think again. Seeing as the J2M2 fills a very nice hole, being able to work very well at incredibly low speeds all the way down to 130 km an hour, all the way up to high speeds of 700 km an hour plus, with its overall control consistency and consistency in altitude performance, working very nicely at 3000 to 5000 meters altitude, I mean until you have flown this plane, you clearly don't know Jack. And so I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. Yet until next time ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies.